I'd like to have just a quick show of hands. Uh, who's been to the doctor recently? Anybody? All right. Not necessarily so good, but I uh, hope you had a good experience. Uh, who has health insurance? Good. Almost everybody's hands went up. And uh, one of the reasons for that is because of this, the Affordable Care Act. This uh, signing was very important for two reasons. One, it made that kid sitting over here one of the uh, most famous kids in all of America as far as health policy. This guy shows up at pretty much every conference I go to. And secondly, it gave uh, people who didn't previously have health insurance, health insurance through the Medicaid expansion. But what was at the bottom of this act? The major thing it did was it sought to improve quality of health care at the same time decreasing cost and doing it for more Americans than ever before. So this happens to things on a small scale. For instance, five years ago, not all hospitals even had electronic medical records. Many institutions, even big name ones, had uh, paper records where somebody actually sat down with a sheet of paper and wrote vital information about your health and hope that it didn't get lost and everybody could read it. It also has led to large-scale changes, such as pretty much the disappearance of the neighborhood hospital. However, this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. These are perhaps the most visible changes, but I would say that we haven't even seen what progression this act is going to have on American health for at least another 10 to 15 years. So the question is, how is the future of American health care going to be different? I would argue that there are two vital forces that are going to shape American healthcare in the future. The first is going to be the move toward patient-centered, personalized medicine, where you're not just a number, a random person, you are you. And you see your doctor, and they design their treatments around uh, your values. The second thing is, of course, the big data revolution for whatever big data means. The question here is, well, what type of people are going to be best adapted to thrive in this environment? And that's important because, one, I'll have to be working with these people for like the next 50 years. It's also important because these people are going to be charged with taking care of the health of our society, i.e., you, me, the people we love, for the next half century. So this is going to sound a little bit crazy, but I think the two essential traits we want are people who can talk to anybody they meet on a city bus and people who can talk, type 90 words a minute. So I know this sounds a little bit odd, so let me break it down. Medical education has, uh, the uh, traditional model of the patient-doctor relationship has been one of paternalism. The doctor would tell you, hey, this is what we're going to do for you. They didn't really consider, well, what are your values? What are your community's values? What are your family values? However, this has fallen out of favor significantly. So what does that have to do with being able to talk to anyone on a city bus? Uh, let me provide a real-world example. This is one of Chicago's busiest hospitals and where I'm currently the uh, senior a surgery resident in-house, and uh, we cover a lot of services. So you can see we cover general surgery, vascular surgery, thoracic surgery, pediatric surgery, pediatric trauma surgery. So if you come to this hospital after 5 p.m., you're going to probably come in through the ER, and then depending on what exactly your complaint is, me and uh, my fearless intern over there, Dr. Moshbury, are going to come evaluate you. And if you say, oh, I have abdominal pain, we're going to need to ask you a lot of different questions, such as, when did this pain start? Does it move anywhere? Does it hurt your back? It is associated with you eating? To a lot more intrusive questions, such as, when you say you're a social drinker, could you quantify that for me? Or even more intrusive questions, such as, you know, in the past month, exactly how many sexual partners have you had? And in order to do, get the accurate answers to these questions, you have to consider that, well, we're meeting people that we've never seen before. I'm not their family doctor. I, this is the first time they've seen me, and this is the first time that I've seen them. And they have an issue that has brought them to the ER in the middle of the night. Getting accurate and honest answers to that is very important. It determines whether or not we take you here to the operating room and you get an operation. It determines whether or not you use thousands of dollars worth of medical testing and imaging and spend days in the hospital, or whether or not you get a sandwich and get to go home. So what is the challenge in the future? Well, I think diversity is a challenge that has been underappreciated in medical education and in society at large. We've estimated that by 2050, there's going to be no dominant racial group in America. It's going to be vastly different than it's been in the past. 
So why is this important? Because while still most physicians come from a kind of typical background, the average physician, for whatever that means, is somebody who is very well educated, obviously educated well enough to have a doctorate, generally of middle to upper class uh, socioeconomic status, um, is traditionally white, and uh, comes from the suburbs, and has been in America for a while. But they're going to be charged with taking care of patients who do not necessarily meet this demographic. And they have to be able to do so in a context where they have to include what those patients think of as their values and also what their families think of as their values. This is the entire uh, idea behind cultural competency. So how do we get there? Well, I would argue that improving language skills amongst physicians is a very important thing to do. We have many different requirements for medical school, but a language requirement is not currently one of them. So why is this important? One, it obviously helps to be able to directly talk with your patient as opposed to have to use a translator. But moreover, the process of learning a language allows you to better understand somebody's culture, who is generally significantly different than yours. And it allows you to be able to relate to that, at least to the point where uh, you're able to talk with them and understand what all of the nonverbal social cues mean. So what language should you learn? I mean, obviously in Chicago, it's very important to know Spanish and Polish and maybe Chinese, but it's not the exact language that you need to learn that matters. I mean, you can learn Klingon for all I care. The point is you need to be able to relate to other people, and the process of learning a language is what's important. So clearly, um, one thing that would be vastly different than the traditional models is I would emphasize the ability to be able to talk to people, because medicine still remains essentially a verbal communication art. Reading and writing is important, but not nearly as important as the ability to hold a conversation. So that seems a little bit, you're kind of getting the point now, but um, what about typing 90 words a minute? That seems like a very strange requirement for the next generation of America's doctors. So it's not just the ability to type, because, um, well, there's a lot of paperwork to be done, quite frankly. There's discharge summaries, there's admin H&Ps, there's operative reports, there's all types of paperwork that needs to get done. It's estimated that, on average, each physician spends six hours per day doing nothing but paperwork. And when that doctor is dealing with paperwork, they're not seeing their patients. And obviously, this is a huge problem when we've rolled out millions and millions more people who are now entering into the healthcare system. But beyond that, I think that you need to consider, well, what types of people are able to type 90 words a minute? I would argue that it's people who are techies, early adopters, um, and have a good background, obviously, in like computer science and whatnot. Well, a lot of our, well, a lot of our uh, advances in medicine have come for people who understand the genetics of the fruit fly. I think that in the future, a lot of the gains we make in healthcare are going to be people who are able to build apps or people who are able to harness technology such as 3D printing in order to deliver better health care to the society. I'm not saying that we need to completely do away with the requirements that are currently there, but I think it's important to recognize that innovation comes from everywhere. For instance, Google has a policy of 20% time, which has given us things such as Gmail, Google Chat, Google, or Google Talk, Google Reader, and I think that we need to consider how that might apply in medical education, how that might improve things for our society. Perhaps we don't need 80% of everybody who shows up to med school being a biology major, a chemistry major, or God forbid, a biochemistry major. So I don't think, the second thing that I think we need to do is to kind of move away from the whole idea that in order to be a good doctor, you need to be good at calculus. I've been told that so many times, and I think it's kind of not really exactly useful. We need to start considering, well, we have a limited amount of time to get people ready to take care of our society, so what can we add to them? I think we need to put a greater emphasis on statistics. And some of the other maybe softer things, I'm sure people listen to stuff like Freakonomics and have heard of uh, behavioral economics and decision theory and game theory. I think with the increasing use of smartphones and apps and things like that, we need to have physicians who really understand what these uh, concepts are. So let me take you through a real world example. So a lot of people in America have diabetes owing to our diet and the fact that we uh, have become increasingly obese and we don't exercise that much. So one of the problems that these patients get is diabetic foot ulcers. A lot of times they need skin grafting and what have you. So as uh, somebody who's going to be a future vascular surgeon, I've done a fair amount of these. And I can say in the operating room, when we're trying to get somebody from A to B, very rarely does my attending look up and say, hey, can you use uh, multiple integration to calculate the uh, centroid of this? Probably not. The real question is, hey, how good are you at arts and crafts? 
So the point with this is we need to really rethink uh, what we're exactly we're selecting for. But is it more important the person who can cut the perfect skin graft and have a good outcome to get us from A to B? Or is the most useful person somebody who could design an app like this that allows people who have diabetes to get reminders such as, oh, I haven't taken my medication today, or here, let me chart my glucose and be able to alert their physician that their blood levels are too high well before they have to show up to the emergency room uh, in extremis. I would argue that these people are going to change the face of medicine. So in conclusion, I think we need to radically rethink who's going to take care of me, who's going to take care of you over the next 50 years. We need to have people who are able to relate to us and consider what our values are and maybe not make the decision that the book says, but maybe make the decision that's best for us and our families. And secondly, we need people who are going to be able to harness modern technology to improve patient outcomes, people who know how to make apps, how to use 3D printing to make cast, and uh, various other new technologies that have traditionally not been uh, in the realm of what's considered the job of a physician. Thank you very much for your time. And go out there, talk to people on buses, and type 90 words a minute.